Hi everyone. Okay, so there are some people out there who still deny the scientific model of our world, and by that I'm referring to its shape and its place in the universe. There are still people who believe the Earth is flat. And there are even some who believe that we're walking around on the inside of a hollow shell. I figured these were pose, but um, recent events have forced me to change my mind about that. So it's time to take them on. The Relativity Fraud Established by trickery, maintained by propaganda. A Simple Exposure for Layman by Malcolm Bowden We're gonna start off with the intellectual elite among them, Malcolm Bowden. Not actually a flat earther, but he is a creationist and a geocentrist. Michelson and Morley tried to check the speed of the Earth through the ether as it orbited the Sun. They expected to measure a speed of about 30 kilometers per second. To their amazement, there was no movement of this order. They actually measured 1 to 10 kilometers per second, but it was still called a null result. Because the result was so close to zero that zero was within the expected margin of error, and it was far below the expected result. This is exactly what we would see if the ether didn't exist and we used less than perfect equipment to carry out the experiment. And you do realize that the experiment has been repeated with more sensitive equipment, right? Later in 1905 and 1915, Einstein produced his relativity theories, which overcame the troublesome Michelson-Morley experiment by simply abolishing the ether. And that solved the problem and allowed physics to move forward. The whole theory is riddled with contradictions and problems, which we will examine. Uh, no, it has its limits, indicating that it's incomplete, but it works perfectly fine within those limits. And I suspect that you simply don't understand it. Before we do so, we will examine a fundamental contradiction in the theory, which will arise several times in various subjects that we deal with. This is known as the clock, or twins, paradox. It totally destroys the whole basis on which the theory is founded. Nope, the twin paradox is a misunderstanding of special relativity. Here's how it works. One twin, S, gets on a spaceship, and one, E, stays on Earth. S travels away from Earth at really high velocity and then turns around and returns, also at really high velocity. E will obviously argue that since S moved at really high velocity, S should be younger than E when he's back on Earth. Less time has passed for S than for E. The paradox is that S can say that it was the Earth, and thus also E, that moved relative to the spaceship, so E should be younger than S, and this is obviously a contradiction. The resolution of the paradox is that S will be in different inertial frames when he leaves and when he comes back, but E will be in the same inertial frame the whole time. This is because S has accelerated as he changed directions, E has not. He only appears to change directions because S accelerates. The two twins do not see mirrored versions of the same situation. Because of the switch of inertial frames, S will be younger than E, according to both of them. You can even use the equations of special relativity, yes, I said special relativity, to calculate by how much. And this is a standard exercise in relativity textbooks, books you should have studied before making this video, Bowden. Though I can definitely understand why you didn't, they're clearly way above your head. See, this is the problem I have with all of this. It's fine to not understand something, especially something this complicated. But it's not fine to still talk about it as if you think you know more than those who actually do understand it. If you're gonna try to refute a well-established scientific theory, the first thing you have to do is study it so you know what it actually says and why it says it. The experiment that was said to confirm relativity and made Einstein famous was the eclipse experiment of 1919. As starlight passes the sun, it is slightly bent. But there are many problems with this experiment. Firstly, they used a mirror to reflect the light into a horizontal telescope. Secondly, the heat of the sun on the mirror warps it. Thirdly, as the cone of darkness crosses the earth, it causes considerable turbulence in the atmosphere due to the change of temperature. 
None of this is in dispute. Gravitational lensing remains a proven fact, though, because we've made far better observations today with space telescopes aimed at distant galaxies. This eliminates the problems you bring up and shows with far greater precision that Einstein was spot on. The flying clocks experiment. Four atomic clocks were flown eastward and then westward. It was claimed that the results supported relativity. However, there is the same objection to the clocks paradox. Okay, you can stop right there. The fact that you don't understand the theory doesn't constitute evidence against it. I've already explained why this isn't a problem. Many clocks at different latitudes are moving at different speeds, but no differences due to this have ever been recorded. The difference in velocity is caused by the fact that one clock is closer to the center of rotation than the other. Because they experience different rates of acceleration due to the Earth's rotation, the one at higher latitude takes sharper turns and thus experiences greater acceleration, they experience different amounts of time dilation due to acceleration. The one at higher latitude slows down more. This cancels out the time dilation caused by the difference in velocity, which is exactly what we'd expect since the clocks are at rest relative to each other and are at the same gravitational potential. You're using the limits of special relativity as evidence against general relativity, Bowden. That's not gonna fly. The precession of Mercury's perihelion. Mercury orbits the Sun in an elliptical orbit, and the long axis slowly rotates with each orbit. Einstein boasted that this unexplained 43 seconds of arc per century was explained by his theory, against which Classical mechanics was powerless, yet no less than four classical explanations were provided. Charles Poor found that if there were a small amount of material around the sun, this would fully explain the 43 seconds. And what would that material be? What other effects would it have that we could look for and confirm its existence? As it stands, this is a completely useless ad hoc explanation. Secondly, the small bulge of the sun's equator causes this precession almost exactly. The reason this was a problem is the fact that this doesn't account for it. The 43 arc seconds per century are what cannot be accounted for. The solar bulge has already been taken into account. Thirdly, in 1898, Gerber accounted for the precession by assuming that gravity propagated at the speed of light. Gerber calculated the speed of gravity by assuming that there was a relationship between this speed and Mercury's precession rate. He could not explain why gravity should have a finite speed or why this should have anything to do with Mercury's rate of precession. It was a completely unjustified assumption that just happened to be correct. Einstein provided the justification. And fourthly, Moon, using the mass of the stars, known as Mach's principle, also obtained the same result as Einstein. Mach's principle in no way conflicts with relativity. It deals with how the distribution of matter at large scales influences inertia locally. When you're standing in a field looking up at the stars and find them at rest, your arms are hanging by your side. If you look up and find the stars in motion, because you're spinning, your arms are affected by a centrifugal force. This can be described as a result of the motion of the stars in that particular frame of reference. It sounds crazy, I know, but the point of general relativity is that there is no correct way of looking at it. Are you spinning or are the stars orbiting you? Those are just two different ways of looking at the same situation, and they should both describe the motions of your arms relative to your body equally well. The only model that allows that and takes relativistic effects like the aforementioned speed of gravity that you accept into account is general relativity. Basically, the subjection is that general relativity doesn't work because it works. Even today, relativists claim that only relativity can explain certain observed phenomena, and therefore it confirms that relativity is true. But, in every case, there is a classical explanation that is never referred to and receives little or no publicity. Yes, in every case where there is a relativistic explanation, there is a classical one, namely the relativistic one. You do know that relativity is a classical theory, right? Classical physics includes everything except quantum mechanics. 
Also, the reason why non-relativistic explanations of relativistic phenomena aren't getting any attention is that they simply don't hold up, since they, by definition, don't take relativistic effects into account. It's like explaining electromagnetism without taking charge into account. It's a non-starter. Muons. These are short-life, high-velocity particles that should have disintegrated before they reach the Earth's surface. As relativity predicts that moving clocks are slower, this is held as a further proof. But Setterfield and Barnes have shown, independent of relativity, that their life can be longer due to their speed. I've looked for a peer-reviewed paper by Setterfield and Barnes and I can't even find a reference to it. If you're going to cite sources, why don't you provide proper references so that I can check for myself? Pierce proved conclusively that Jews are from space. See, I can play that game too. We have shown how the Michelson-Morley null result was the real reason why Einstein abolished the ether. But it was not a null result, for speeds of up to 10 kilometers per second were recorded by Miller, who continued with a similar apparatus studying these results for the rest of his life. Look, Michelson-Morley experiments are being run continuously today with far more sensitive equipment and there has been no sign of the ether. Also, every time we use a GPS device, we use technology that wouldn't work if the speed of light were different in different directions. Sorry, but the ether simply doesn't exist. Sanyat passed a light both ways around a revolving table and found that the fringe changes corresponded with the speed of the rotation. This proved that there was an ether contradicting relativity. Um, in what universe? The light was traveling through the ether at a fixed rate. No, it was traveling at a fixed rate, period. That's the point. The mirrors, going with or against the direction of the light, gave the interference fringe changes he recorded. And these are always the same regardless of how fast you're moving or in what direction. Again, that's the whole point. Modern laser compasses use this effect today. Right, because once they're calibrated to point in a certain direction, the fact that the speed of light is constant is what keeps them pointing in that direction. You're citing an example of how the non-existence of the ether is used for practical purposes as evidence of its existence. Einstein. What sort of a man was he? This section is an ad hominem and it's completely irrelevant, so I'm just gonna skip it. Comments by scientists. Rutherford treated the theory as a joke. This is also irrelevant. How people reacted to the theory before the overwhelming evidence that we have today was available has no impact on its validity. Today, so accepted is the theory that few are prepared to risk their careers by criticizing it. Right, because you can't ignore one of the cornerstones of physics and still be taken seriously as a physicist. Relativists and evolutionists dominate the mass media and criticisms thereby are muted and ignored. Just like criticisms of the sexual theory of human reproduction would. The anti-Christian modern propaganda. The question that must be addressed is why should anyone want to impose relativity upon the scientific community knowing it to be false? Irrelevant since it's not. It's perfectly valid at macroscopic scales and that's where it's applied. To answer this we have to take a broad view of modern concepts, of which relativity is but one, and it becomes obvious that they are all fundamentally anti-Christian. No, but even if they were that would have no impact on the validity of the theory. This earth is at the center of God's interest. Prove it. You can start by proving that God, the specific God you're talking about, exists because it is the only place where he has placed life. Prove that God not only exists, but that he created life here. Then prove that no life exists anywhere else. You're making a lot of completely unfounded claims here. Therefore, he has made it the center of the universe. The Earth is only the center of the observable universe, and that's only for the trivial reason that we must observe the universe from where we happen to be. Far from land, your boat is always the center of the observable ocean. Or do you mean it's the center in a metaphorical sense? Somehow I doubt it. For it is only on this planet that he is playing out what I call the drama of the universe. 
and nowhere else. Again, prove it. And finally, a thought for the viewer. Only in the Christian faith can man find peace with God, stability, significance and security, despite an increasingly chaotic and dangerous world. This has nothing to do with relativity and it's completely false. Every theistic religion I know of offers peace with its gods. Stability, significance and security don't come from religion. The world is more peaceful and orderly than in any other period in recorded history. You are absolutely wrong. Christ claimed to be God. So he was either mad, bad, or God. Or four, completely fictional, or five, a fictional character loosely based on an actual person. But how is this relevant? What is your decision? That's not my decision to make. I can't choose what's true. Reality is what it is, irrespective of what I want it to be. Nor can I choose what to believe, because I want to believe whatever is true. And the facts available to me determine what I consider most likely to be true for the time being. And that's option 5, with option 4 being the only serious competitor. The only decision I can make regarding this is whether I want my beliefs to reflect reality or not. And to get back to what this video of yours was supposed to be about, it's clear that your only real objection to relativity is that you don't want to accept the reality that the world isn't what Christians believed it to be 500 years ago. Relativity is one of the many scientific theories that conflict with your primitive outdated beliefs. And that's even by creationist standards. So you have made the decision not to care about reality. And by doing so, you have completely eliminated yourself from any discussion of the topic in question. Reality, that is. See ya.